Ready. I think uh, we got a nice group here. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, the first of three panels for Uneven Measures, which is a series from American Composers Forum and I Care If You Listen. Uh, we are looking at the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, which gave uh, some women the right to vote 100 years ago. Um, and what that moment means in this year, this election year, is we're all in the middle of electing the next president, among other elected officials. Um, and I'm very pleased um, to, sorry, we have a lot of people joining us. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to have uh, a member of our um, funder as well. If you can call, go to the next slide, Laura, we are very pleased this has been supported by the Elizabeth and Michelle Sorrell mm -hmm. Charitable Organization. I welcome Wendy on behalf of the organization. And I'd love to introduce my fellow panelists. I'm Vanessa Rose, CEO of American Composers Forum. I'm also joined by Gabriela Lena Frank, Lisa Funderberg Hoffman, Stephen Miles, and Monkwe Nadosi. This is Transformative Power, Women Leading. And we include a little hashtag there if you feel so inclined to, uh, to use social media while we're talking here today. So you can end the slide. Um, I do want to acknowledge that this panel is being recorded and we are going to be publicly sharing this panel. So if any of you are not comfortable with that, um, you're welcome to keep uh, yourself hidden <laughs> from video. And also if, if you need to leave, uh, you're um, invited to do so. I want to acknowledge that nobody is or should be defined simply by their gender identity, race, economic status, musical preference, or other attributes. Our hope with this panel is to demonstrate that similarly, there's no one way for women to approach leadership. However, for women, non-binary individuals, and members of the trans community, there remain systemic barriers to participation and outdated expectations for what qualities a leader must have to be successful. Our focus today is on women, but there are many communities marginalized who deserve the spotlight and conversation as well. We hope our next two panels in this series include more of those experiences. So welcome everybody. Uh, I would love to invite the, my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, uh, share their preferred pronoun, a little bit about themselves and how you identify as a leader. Gabriella, why don't you go first? Uh, hello, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Gabriella Lita Frank. I am a freelance composer. I identify as uh, she, her, and uh, I'm a bit of an accidental leader in that I always try to model as, as a woman of color. And I came of age in the 90s when it wasn't very common to see women of color that were training at a high level in a classical conservatory. But I think that it was just impressed upon me as it is when you are a phenomenon just for existing. And then I think it became, uh, I, I claimed this idea of leadership when I founded a small but potent training institution for emerging composers about four years ago. Thank you. Stephen. Hi, everybody. So I'm Stephen Miles, um, he, him pronouns. Um, I recently retired from New College of Florida, the State Honors College for the State University System of Florida. I retired there after 32 years. I'm still catching my breath. That was only this past month. Um, at New College, um, I founded, I was the founding director of New Music New College, which is now in its 22nd year. Um, and from 2011 to 2017, I was the provost and vice president for academic affairs. Now, the fact that New College would appoint a provost who is an experimental composer <laughs> says a lot about the character of New College. Um, and experimental composition and academic administration might seem like they have very little to do with each other. Uh, but I actually found uh, that they have a lot in common. So my compositions are structured improvisations that involve the voices of everyone present. And by voices, I mean that literally. These are usually vocal pieces. So my job as a composer is to fashion a structure that is uh, flexible enough to allow for everyone's input, but strong enough to focus everyone's effort. It's basically helping a group find a balance between individual agency and collective responsibility. Uh, so I think that applies to experimental music, but it also applies to academic leadership and to leadership as a whole. 
Thank you, Stephen. Monkway. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you to everyone for being here. A fabulous group of folks. Um, my name is Monkwe Monica Nkatwatindosi. I'm a Tanza Minnesotana, um, uh, African American, um, um, a composer and cultural worker, and an improviser working between the dias African diasporic uh, musical forms. Um, as I said, also particularly a, a, a an improviser as well, and worked extensively with um, folks in and around the AACM, the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians out of Chicago um, and creative music. But then I also work interdisciplinary, work with um, performers of all different kinds, poets, visual artists, um, and gardeners, animals, wind, water, and I'm a culture worker, so I'm also here to um, weave creative practice back into all of the angles and corners and curves of our lives, believing that creative practice can help us access our imagination and our power and our togetherness. So I'm about collaboration, I'm about relationship, I'm about putting the values that we want forward and making and, and helping to um, support people becoming their most powerful and creative selves. That's me. Thank you very much. Beautiful. And Lisa. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Lisa Funderburg Hoffman. Um, I'm the daughter of Gwendolyn and Charles Funderburg, granddaughter of Julia and Sonny Davis, Juanita and Owen Funderburg. I am the mother of Jessica, Philip, and Leo, the partner and fiance of Nicole. And I also, in my day job, I am the executive director of the Alliance of Artists Communities. Um, I like to describe myself as a leader, as being somewhat confused, ahead, behind, a survivor, a winner. I go by the pronouns she, her, hers, but I really do prefer that you call me by my name. Um, I am Black, I am Onkachok and Shikachukat, and I want to say thank you to Vanessa and the American Composers Forum for having me here today. Um, it's really an honor and privilege, and um, I'm just really deeply interested in uh, treating people better. <laughs> um, that feels like my life purpose and my life work um, to really think about creating a sense of belonging for everyone and, and embracing our shared humanity. So thank you. Thank you all of you. Um, I'm very honored to be here with all of you. Um, I'm curious how gender identity may or may not um, inform how you feel others see you as a leader, not necessarily you, but how others um, have the perception or expectations of you as a leader. Or may not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can jump in if that if everyone's okay with that. Um, Please do. As a, you know, as a woman, as a black woman, um, it, it has really been an interesting ride. I, I've primarily worked in education and nonprofit uh, throughout my career. And in education, uh, it feels a lot very parallel to the role that I hold now at the Alliance is that it's deeply rooted in uh, caregiving, like this expectation of a very maternalistic value of the work that I bring, um, often thought to look at, so like to take care of, uh, to put others before me or my individual practice or individual needs um, all guised under this this idea of care and um it is it is it's beautiful because and in, in some way you step outside of yourself but on on the other hand uh it does somewhat put a cap or a ceiling i, I have often felt that uh the perception is that you know not what I can do, but often framed about what I cannot do or what my experience um, does not lend to or what um, I'm not able to navigate because um, of, of my perceived pedigree or, or where um, 
my my origin story, and it's really really interesting. Um, I went to an HBCU, and I'm a really proud alumni of Howard University. And you know, for years, it was like Howard. What is Howard? And you know, we there was such a sense of pride about uh, coming from Howard. And now that Kamala Harris is uh, uh, Democratic VP candidate, it is just like everyone knows Howard now, but it's always the perception of this thought is being seen that you really have to prove that you can be in the room, that you can hold the space and, and having really developed most of my career in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, like that you, you can at least sit at the table with the big boys. And it, I, I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot that, you know, uh, that if you can show a certain amount of brass tacks and, and really take on the persona of what I consider the cis white male in a room, you can get a lot of things done um, and, and get a lot of buy-in. So yeah, I, I've always felt there've been certain limitations, uh, but now there seems to be a certain running to black women in this particular moment as well. Thank you. Um, that actually speaks to what we're seeing in the research also. Um, yeah, there's a, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is a series that's celebrating the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote 100 years ago, but also recognizes how many people are still fighting to have that right in 2020. Um, we're seeing this election season, for example, the U.S. still struggling to have people other than cis white men um, as um, elected, high level elected officials. There's in fact a Pew Charitable Trust report from 2018 that shows a clear party distinction in those preferences. Um, every year, for the last several years, the McKinsey um, Consulting Group has been doing a report on women in the workplace. And the most recent one, right at the beginning of the pandemic, showed that only 3% of corporate C-suite executives are women of color, and 19% are white women, compared to 12% of color, men of color, and 66% white men. Despite that research, despite the research that demonstrates company profits and share performance can be as much as 50% higher for companies when women are well, well represented at the top. A larger percentage of women, especially women of color, have been furloughed because of the pandemic. The McKinsey report also found the pandemic may be amplifying biases women have faced for years. Higher performance standards, harsher judgment for mistakes, and penalties for being mothers and for taking advantage of flexible work options. I'm curious, um, maybe from the rest of you, um, uh, if you have other examples that, that demonstrate how you have faced these uh, systemic barriers, prejudice, expectations because of your gender. Maybe, maybe not you, Stephen, we'll come back to you. Well, well, I, okay. <laughs> Although maybe, yeah. maybe you have something over to you. No, that's okay, I'll, I'll wait. I have something to say. Um, well, thank you for, for having me on and for asking me these important, crucial, important questions. Um, I think that our cultures and in fact cultures around the world have struggled to have women seen as leaders outside of, of the home, outside of families and communities. Um, and I think that as much as, as critical as it's critical for us to be everywhere and for us to be able to be seen to be everywhere, I really am feeling the, the sense, especially as a woman, of, as a black woman, um, of being always at the edge, um, always having to navigate or to pr try to navigate the expectations of others, especially if you're in an organization that's not for primarily black or, or um, a BIPOC uh, organization. Um, and then, as you said, uh, um, whenever uh, mistakes are punished more harshly, um, and the expectation, much as Black people have, the expect, have this expectation of being, to navigate, being able to navigate pain more, more regularly, is that we're, able, we're expected to navigate the, a lower set of resources or navigate with a lot lower set of resources than others. And I feel like some, so much of this is un, even un, unconscious or subconscious um, and subconscious valuing of, of, our, of our worth. Um, and, and sometimes it comes from us too, though. I mean, so there's systemic aspects and I don't think that there's a, a, a dearth of examples of that. And so I'll, I want to also 
but I especially want to speak to um, Black women who may watch this or Black um, Indigenous and, and BIPOC women who might watch this because as important as it is to not uh, to be um, attending to and for all of us to be transforming expectations of women on the outside, it's as important and a lot of times as even more important for us to navigate those internalized feelings on the inside. Because when we're in a society which constantly is telling us that we are less than, that we don't deserve as much, that is actually um, keeping from us the actual range of, we'll say, um, funding that's available, the actual range of, of how much money uh, people who are in our positions actually get paid. Um, uh, there's ways in which um, we will do to ourselves even before or, or in, in tandem with the world doing to us. Um, so um, this is not at all to minimize because there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of ceilings, you know, uh, that people don't want, uh, people feel uncomfortable in some ways um, when folks walk in the room. Just as a black woman, you walk in the room if it's not a, a woman, uh, a situation in which black women are uh, often in the room, um, uh, even a black woman or even a black person entering a, a, what has been primarily an all white space, um, the subconscious um, uh, fear or defensiveness um, can end up uh, constraining how you're expected to act or how people act uh, how people decide to be in, in a relationship with you as well as all of the stereotypes you know um, that get put upon you before uh, you're able to even have conversation or have a relationship so it's crucial for folks to understand and um, I guess it's, I don't want to I don't want to just focus on talking to white people only but um, that there's a, such a wide variety and a, a spectrum of experience and life experience and histories, um, schools, um, families that we have um, in and with us, um, places where we come from, and that there's no way for, uh, like it's one of those things where statistics are smart and dumb at the same time. Um, statistics are smart from uh, a sort of a hawk's eye view but they're dumb when you get real right up close with somebody. So it's crucial for us to be able to, especially when we're right up close with somebody, to actually learn about who who we are. Um, and then to be able to navigate your own issues, you know, your own discomfort, wh whether you know or don't know uh, Black people or not. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's crucial for you to be able to, because uh, I, I mean, speaking to white people, the most segregated people in the, in the country. And so if you only have one particular vector of relationship with a brown, black, brown, indigenous person, then um, you're going to be sort of putting all, trying to put all of your engagement, all of your expectation, all of your questions, all of your stereotypes through that one person, which is not fair at all. So it's crucial for everybody to be um, curious about people other than themselves, learning about and being in real relationship with people other than folks who are like themselves. That's probably enough, there's more. <laughs> um, well, so much is being said here that is, I'm resonating like a bell. <laughs> and it's uh, triggering so many memories. And um, I think, you know, first of all, I have to do a shout out also to Kamala because um, she went to school in my hometown and she and my brother were contemporaries. And when she described what it was like with these intellectuals and artists, immigrants and children of immigrants coming in, you know, in the seventies of, of Berkeley, I mean, that's my, that's my upbringing. And we have um, intellectuals and artists in my family. My, 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 my brother is the first uh, Latino to graduate from Stanford with a doctorate in neuroscience. And my mom's a really, you know, accomplished Peruvian Chinese stained glass artist. And so I think, you know, the first model that I had of leadership came from within my family in that way, just like what Kamala had. And I, there's a real sense of kind of East Bay pride <laughs> when I see a woman of color like her, who's also a daughter of immigrants 
and that's that's something else that complicates when we talk about race is that we're also talking about the american identity of having always brought in people and we have a very hard time with that can't tell you how many times that uh, when I say I'm proven American, it means that I was born in Peru, that people cannot just imagine a proven American being born here, that this is what a patriot looks like. I am a patriot and this is what it, one looks like. So, you know, as we're talking about what are the qualities of leadership that are needed um, by women, women of color in particular, and I think it's this ability to not wither under all kinds of attention. I mean, when I look at somebody like Kama and I, I see you know, members of this panel and others that I'm proud to call mi hermanas and my sisters, they are so strong. The strength they have and the strength they have to hang on to their sense of humor and their joy to withstand what I used to call, you know, in my day, <laughs> uh, that, that the young, Youngins are calling microaggressions and so much of what they're experiencing and articulating better than I could really have made me look back on my life to see, you know, I was really strong in that situation. I did not even know it, but I was, I was practicing these qualities of leadership that now I'm asked to articulate. And I think that's an essential quality and to not wither, it could be the attention of, do you deserve that seat? We, we open up a seat just for you. You're a black lady or a Latino lady. Are you going to waste these resources? that could have gone to the, the typical occupant of that seat. It could be the kind of attention that you're behind in the race, you have to make up for a deficit. It could be attention um, as to, can you handle the pressure? We're giving you this opportunity. You're gonna get reviewed by the New York Times and be played by a top five orchestra. And, I mean, that's been the coinage of my life. And, you know, I, I experienced a really high attrition of my colleagues, many talented, wonderful artists that we forced out and that we have deprived ourselves as a community of the talent and contributions of so many because they weren't in on the secret that you need to put your articulations in this place in your orchestra score or you know, any number of hoops that had to be jumped and I managed this obstacle course there's a lot of serendipity and luck in my life but we can't wait for that magical confluence of so many factors in order to put out a woman of color into leadership. We actually need to look at the, the ground that we have fostered and, and what we lose. So I think, you know, when you look at leaders that they've been able to um, navigate uh, incredible pressures. Um, and, and then I also find that leaders, true leaders, when they become successful, and I've been really blessed with a, with a substantial career, um, and I aspire to be somebody that then looks at that success as leverage. It's leverage to change the world. You get a prize, that's great, but what are you gonna do with it? It's responsibility, and what can you now bring attention to, and what hand can you extend to the people around you? Um, and then to look at, are you inspiring white guys? I think it's very moving with this tiny academy out of my home that there are white guys that look at me, a middle-aged Latina, as a mentor. And that's progress. That's like not a thing for them. I mean, they expect to get this kind of uh, mentorship. Um, I, there's a lot of mistakes that I made and I, I think that leaders surround themselves by people that know more than them. And I've been benefited so much from people of uh, every gender, every ways, you know, that have advised me. Um, I don't know if you, the two of you, Lisa and, and Monkway, if you've also shared this experience, but sometimes when I felt there was denial, denial of my being, a denial of my presence, denial of my voice, I could not always unpack whether it against my gender, whether it against my race, whether it against my being a child of an immigrant or, or a, a, a from that hot spot of Antifa, Berkeley. I mean, I could not always unpack that. And uh, I, I think that, I'm not sure it's always necessary to, but it, it, there's so much work that needs to be done and these kinds of conversations um, are necessary for us to uh, embrace how many leaders we do have among us.
Vanessa. Um, sure, Steve. So, so I want to connect back with what you were saying, Monque, because you said you started by talking about what it is to go into the room and to already be dealing with uh, sort of the psychological burden of feeling like, okay, are people respecting me? Um, is my voice being heard? My experience as a white male is that, you know, it is so difficult to get beyond your maleness and your whiteness. When I started the conservatory in 1972, there were no women, uh, no female students. There were no female members of the faculty in composition. And I'll be honest, I didn't really notice that that was wrong. That was what was. That seemed like what was normative. Um, and I would say that it's a, it's a process for me to uh, can be able to see, you know, the privileges that I have, um, that I get received by being white and by being male, um, or conscious about uh, uh, the role of gender uh, in music, uh, in the eighties, I was reading a lot of musicology shout outs to, uh, Susan McClary, Rose Sabotnik and others reading sociology of music. Um, but I want to say if, if to get this into the model of leadership, um, I've taught at new, I've taught at new college for half my life. And so it has had a tremendous impact, an experiential impact on what it means to be a leader. New college, is, uh, as I said earlier, it's a small liberal arts college. The primary pedagogical mode is discussion. It is not lecture. That's really, really important in terms of how it shapes the way you regard communication and others' voices. Um, when I was teaching, I really didn't lecture that much, but I will tell you this, I, had a, I was in a class once where I must have spoken just a little bit too much because two of the students, two women in the class, Laura Lisbister and Kate McDowell, they greeted me at the door one day and said, okay, today you're not speaking. Today, we just want you to listen. Um, and here I, I had taken such pride in being a good listener, but they were saying <laughs> you just need to listen. Um, I th I'm really grateful that I had the experience at New College that said, your primary responsibility is to listen to the voices that are around you, to pay attention. And I think that that's what leadership really is about. It's not about you, it's about paying attention to those people around you and allowing those voices to come up. So that's something that I learned here, but it's been a real journey, I'll tell you. Thank you for sharing that, Stephen. There's so uh, much to say. And Lisa, I saw yeah. that you were almost ready to speak as well. I have a couple of things to say, but I'm curious as to where you would be gone. Oh, you're, I think you're muted still. You're muted. Yep. <laughs> this mute button. I was thinking about a lot about uh, Gabriella's question to us about the distinction between um, our identity as women and um, really my racial identity as a black woman. And I think, you know, because I, I grew up on Long Island and then um, lived in DC and then Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and now here in, in Providence, but um, in different stages. But, you know, in the South in particular, it is hard to separate anything from your racial identity. Uh, it is hard to not notice that you are a person of color, a black person in the space, and, and to really acknowledge and recognize the, the lack of power in that space and, and the uneven distribution of power and, and the weight of that and, and how easily, um, you know, I, I'm listening to you, Stephen, it's like, you know, we have so many leaders that say, you know, we want to hear what you have to say. And then when you say it, then you cut out from the conversation. <laughs> You're not invited back. <laughs> really, that's, that's the end of that. Um, and, and, and that, that was really a, a real experience for me so often um, in this New South story. So um, I, I do think I, I have it hard. I have a hard time um, trying to parse out. Is it because, uh, is, it, is it me being black in the space or is it me being a woman in the space? And, and I, I tend to think that it's black first because, you know, I, I, I do believe deeply that 
um, one, that Black women are, 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 are the life givers of the world, but then second to that, we're the most maligned um, and, and we suffer really harshly um, across multiple, multiple systems and domains and it's a high expectation of what we're supposed to do. And uh, there's a total, total lack of acknowledgement of pain and, and uh, what we're experiencing. So uh, that really resonated with me and I appreciated that question. Just, just thank you for that. Yeah, I, I also I hear both, Lisa, what you're saying, what Gabrielle is saying, and some of sort of what's the, the shadow side to what you allude to, Stephen, is the sort of double and triple layers of work that, that um, women leaders have to do and that Black or Latinx uh, Indigenous women leaders also have to do. There is the level, and, and I think it also depends on the environment, right? So like if you're in a primarily white environment and in this uh, culture, what has been privileged and in fact protected are institutions that assert um, European values, European institutions, European cultural ways and structures as being normal, as you said, Stephen, as being the norm, as being legitimate, as being excerpt, expert, ex, you know, um, as being brilliant, often all the while, stealing from um, and using um, from the, the cultures of people around the world. I think, and I think that that, and, and I think the, the subconscious underpinnings of that also add to the levels of work and the levels of insecurity that um, women leaders, that black and brown women leaders have inside of white institutions, which is what makes our presence so brittle and so difficult to maintain for so long. Because, um, because each organization, each group has a culture. And if you're constantly working to push into that culture, I think um, that, that is a grinding and that is a weathering that uh, takes its toll. Um, and then as a leader in those institutions, if you do have an, have an opportunity to be there, you're also um, often either explicitly or implicitly uh, charged with um, integrating the organization and dealing with their cultural integration desires. Um, also being able to uh, care for and manage whether that's on the clock or off the clock because you care on your own about um, black and brown and BIPOC. Uh, students or, or, or younger people who are participating in, in the organization. Um, and so there's like uh, these levels of work that a lot of times other people don't see or don't take for granted. Um, and then also have no compassion for because it's not visible to anyone but unless you're inside of it. Um, and so then any, again, going back to any problems that come up or challenges that come up um, again you know, in, in the way that this country has been set up um, black people particularly and anyone who's poor is for, sort of meant to be kept in line and so um, the uh, disciplining or uh, censure or correcting that often goes on um, to try to uh, make someone who is uh, make someone conform um, is very very particular very painful and very difficult to deal with on a long-term basis but I also want to say that there are I, I feel like the the joy there are joys of being and the privilege of being able to be to being black and the privilege of my history and the privilege of the ancestry and the other the, the other aspect of it is the um, you, you do get uh, uh, tired, uh, you do get worn, and you do get, uh, ex you do get a, a, a level of sophistication that is also not recognized and is also not appreciated, I think, inside of the culture, inside of navigation of white worlds. Um, and then when you're not in white worlds, um, the joy you have with being with your people. Um, I think that myself, I have, uh, tended to having grown up in a primarily white environment, my craving after going to school was to find non-white environments. So understanding and realizing that there is an aspect of, um, you know, if we look at the philanthropic uh, world, if we look at the world of, of money, 
uh, what institutions are supported for long term, what institutions are, are um, allowed to continue. Um, um, I've really sought out black and brown and indigenous um, organizations, associations, groups where I could feel like I could to relax and be myself completely. Uh, and it's another level of work in some ways to be building things from scratch or to be building with coalitions of people, but it's, um, but it's, it's not necessarily more work, it's a different kind of work mm -hmm. and allows also for a different kind of ease in the belly that to me has been crucial for my keeping my own sanity and my own in, um, enjoyment of, of life and, and um, uh, encouragement um, to, make things, to make things happen because what's hard inside of sometimes uh, working to uh, sort of bust into white worlds is for myself, I have noticed that it feels like I'm still, con I'm continuing to underline this idea of legitimacy of these structures in legitimacy of, of the whatever table exists um, and the fight is to be part of the table when actually the fight is to or the, or the joyous um, exercise the um, is to change the table completely to make a new table um, um, yeah to make a new table where everyone's um, uh, in, in small groups and in large groups where everyone's um, what everyone brings the skills and gifts and ancestry and cultural prowess and wisdom and experience is actually valued. Um, and that's something which we don't talk about in that it's not really always just about integrating other people's places because we've not fared very well inside of the way that integration has happened. If we look at the way integration has happened in schools or not happened, um, that I feel like it's as important for there to be support of institutions, uh, black and brown indigenous institutions as well. Thank you, Mankwe. Um, I, uh, I wanted just to add to this conversation as, as a white woman in a primarily white space for a lot of my career, my own experience has actually been that lack of community that you're talking about, Mankwe, and, and uh, women not necessarily supporting each other and certainly um, the uh, you know the the dynamic with cis white men in the in the space too. So I want to also acknowledge how many men are here with us today, which I really appreciate because it does take all of us to be um, having this conversation together and recognizing um, uh, the many voices that need to be part of this conversation. And I also want to thank Lisa and Gabriella is having some computer problems, but she's going to come back. <laughs> and you Monkwe for for being so vulnerable in this space as well um, as you are often asked to do so i wanted to offer just uh, some some of my own um vulnerability as well and and acknowledge the imposter syndrome that i've certainly faced for much of my career and i know is one that uh, is something that many women um are challenged with gabrielle is back i believe um so uh, and i also want to say stephen uh, as i say this with tongue in cheek as the token male on the on the panel uh we were very happy to have you with us also because you are the co-chair of acf's board alongside nirmala regisekar who will be in another panel and then of course with me as ceo so there's um uh there's a, a wonderful ge wonderful gender imbalance i think in that leadership uh model that i think has just been a, a really um um, effective and I think really um, wonderful dynamic at least that, that I've experienced. Um, Gabriella, sorry we missed you. Welcome back. <laughs> no, it's okay. This is our our challenge in, in today's environment. Wanted to um, now pivot, if if I may, uh, to um, and I was I was just sharing that I so appreciate each of you bringing your experiences and and challenges to this conversation um, and vulnerability, which. Um, it's just so uh, amazing of you to, to do that for us. Um, some positive ways that we can move forward. I think the fact that we're having this conversation is, 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 is a step. The listening we talked about, but our action as well. And I'm curious um, to hear from each of you, what are some things for the, everybody on this, um, in this panel, and we'll be listening to this uh, afterwards as well, 
what are some things for us to think about? What are some tangible takeaways you, you'd really like to offer this conversation um, or things that we really need to be investigating, interrogating more in addition to what you've already shared? I think, you know, one thing that um, I have really appreciated over these past few months has been when um, people that belong to demographics that have been supported historically have approached me and carefully and, and really um, with a great deal of respect and asking for advice or asking for counsel and not wanting to take a misstep and, and they want to do something but they are afraid to uh, make a mistake or to cause offense and it's um, they don't want to be fragile in that way that um, they've seen maybe peers of theirs that are sometimes well-intentioned but are clumsy and uh, committing the sin of virtue signaling on others' traumas and they realize that that's even a thing. So I think one of the things that we can do is to, for a little bit longer, maybe for the sake of the next generation, is to embrace a little more exhaustion. <laughs> You know, when I hear some of my youngins talking about how tired they are constantly explaining what it is like to be a black person, a Latino person, a woman, I get it. Um, and then I will try to say gently to them saying, you know, um, I, I appreciate what you're saying and I know this exhaustion. I didn't even realize I was exhausted when I was coming of age in the 90s. I just did it. There was like, what do you mean don't explain? And um, there wasn't an, enough other people of color to even express that. It was like a state of being to constantly strategize how I'm gonna be heard. I mean, you're always, your brain is always in the second place, not just in your work, but how to get it received. And so um, I think that if those of us that are experienced, maybe have some calluses, like the good kind, have some muscle built up, if we can be open to those kinds of conversations, to signal that we can do that, that'd be great. Um, but I also think then for, for people to keep having these conversations, to me, this is an action. This is not just a conversation. Right. Because what we're doing is we're normalizing that, hey, maybe reparations is the way. And um, you cannot support you know, a, a person of color without also supporting Black Lives Matter. And if you support Black Lives Matter, that's going to shine a light on the state of Central Americans that are undocumented because their state of being carries really scary remnants of slavery. It's really when you really start to think about, you know, these things, and we are still addicted to this kind of way of not seeing people as full human beings. So this conversation is an action and it's coming from people that people can relate to. Like you look at me and I'm not that scary, <laughs> you know, but, but, uh, it's important you know, to, to realize that these are the kinds of experiences that are visited upon people that you love and that you respect. Uh, so I applaud, I applaud all of you for creating this kind of space and encouraging people to ask and to discuss. Uh, Lisa, I think you're unmuted. Are you? Oh, good, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay, good. And then um, Steven. Um, I, 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 I really appreciate everything that has been shared thus far um, because I, like Gabriella, I, I do believe it, it starts with the conversation. Um, as I was thinking about this talk, I, I, I'm always going back to things that I'm reading and I feel like in this moment and in this time that I, I, I'm, I'm sharpening up on, on my history, uh, reading a lot more, taking in, um, new ways of consuming information, looking at different texts and uh, going outside of, of those folks that I normally read, uh, but but further looking for what's really good about it. Like what's really good about John O'Donoghue as an Irish poet and bell hooks, where does that, where do they intersect and, and what is uh, what, what is the opportunity? Um, and I don't know, I'm really into Irish poets right now, whether it's John O'Donnell or David White. And I said, you know, the beautiful question shapes a beautiful mind. And before you know it, that starts to transform the mind. But this idea of having continued conversation uh, with the intention of, of curiosity and knowledge and, and understanding and bridging and creating a sense of belonging 
um, but being really attentive to the harm um, when we don't pause, when we don't listen, when we don't ask first or when we make assumptions, I think is really super important in this moment. And um, the more I see of that, um, the more hopeful I become, um, the more inspired I am, and then the more I, I feel motivated to, to have conversations with, with people that are, um, that are not uh, identical to me, that are not, that are not from um, the same uh, background. Um, we don't maybe share whether it's the neighbor across the street, whether it's the person in the grocery store, whether it's somebody who is expressing a political view uh, that is very different to mine. It, it's finding that common space without uh, thinking about we, we have to be different and we have to be combative, but where do we bridge and what do we share in terms of our shared humanity? And, and I think that's really super important. Um, and, and I think particularly for women, I was thinking Audre Lorde wrote a letter to Mary Daly and she says, the oppression of women knows no ethnic, no racial boundaries true, but that does not mean it is identical within those differences, nor do the reservoirs of our ancient power know these boundaries. To deal with one without even alluding to the other is to distort our commonality as well as our difference. And it, I find that really quite lovely and beautiful because we, we we, we cannot just forget or erase <laughs> the past or the experiences of other people in a sense to say that this is the new way or this is what is happening or this is what is true. And, and I, I think that starts with beautiful questions and I think that starts with an invitation to have a conversation. Um, and, and sometimes it's a quiet and slow conversation versus the fast and let's get to the point. Um, and, and for me, that's been the action that I've been trying to live by because there is so much happening, um, there's so much negativity. There's so much uh, wear, tear, uh, my quote, you said it beautifully, weathering uh, of individuals and we're all trying to fight the good fight uh, for the greater good. But we, we do have to start expressing beyond care and we have to start showing a little love and, and expressing that as an action. And I think that starts with, with the question and the conversation. So. Mm -hmm. Just trying to live by that now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Stephen, did you want to offer something too? You're muted, by the way. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, first, I just wanted to say that uh, it has been a real pleasure to work with you and with Nirmala. Um, that being a trio um, means that we we are. It's very conversational. It's, there's not this kind of dyadic um, uh, structure um, that uh, leadership for ACF really has to start with listening. And that's what we have to do together. Um, I just wanted to say with ACF, um, you know, I've been on the board since 2016. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful organization. And we started having a conversation about uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Um, oh, several years ago. And it was clear that we wanted to transform the organization, but what became very, very clear to us was that we weren't getting the job done. And Vanessa, when we hired Vanessa just about, I think, 18 months ago, 19 months ago, uh, basically what Vanessa, we, we tasked her, help us, we are not really accomplishing this. And, and this, basically what Vanessa and consultants and a lot of conversation taught us is that if we want to make progress on that, that has to be the center of what we do. That can't be one of several uh, priorities. You have to start with that because everything really flows from that. Um, and we saw this even in terms of, of uh, the notion of being a composer. We had to examine the fact that, that, the, that our implicit definition based on our programs the implicit definition of a composer was it's someone who's recently working in kind of a Western, a European mode where it's all notated. Um, and that's what provided the legitimacy. So we had to unpack that. Uh, but the organization now is uh, really organized around racist uh, work. And um, this is not, it, it goes beyond intentions. It gets in commitments over the next five years for 60% you know, uh, of the artists whom we're promoting would be BIPOC, that the panelists that are making decisions about inclusion 
that 60% of those panelists need to be BIPOC. So we, um, we know that numbers really matter. Intentions can be very soft, but when we, we want to hold ourselves to that, uh, to a standard. Um, I also wanted to say that, get back to what, what others have been mentioning about this kind of a conversation, that we are the American Composers Forum. This really about uh, having the conversation that we don't have the answers, we need to listen to each other and we need to have that, that conversation be as inclusive as possible. Um, thank you, everyone's so brilliant on this. Um, there's such brilliance everywhere, so I'm very excited to be in conversation with y'all. <laughs> um, um, one of the things that I'd like to think about um, when I think about transformation of our society to be in our world to be more human, um, to be more generative, to be um, more expressive of the majesty and brilliance around us, um, which also comes from the non-human world as well, um, is for us to uh, examine things not from a good person, bad person, especially when, well, to be able to think about how, when things are difficult, how are we going to deal with it? And one of the frames, particularly in terms of the oppressive frames, whether it's racism, whether it's hetero homosexual, uh, 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 homophobia, whether it's um, uh, sexism or misogyny, um, has to do with changing the dynamic or changing the framework that we use to examine things from being a uh, you're a good person if you do it you're a bad person if you or you're a bad person if you do it you're a good person if you don't kind of realm and this these fixed points to being one of where we become pattern spotters pattern spotters inside of us and pattern spotters outside of us knowing that there are no um, plexiglass walls, there are no fixed borders, the air has no, does not believe in the borders, the water does not believe in the borders, the people, as Gabriella spoke to, can't really, and we're moving into a place where, especially with the globalization of our communication, of our information, um, the, the, the frameworks that we have taken as solid as the way it is will have will more and more have to be re-examined. And so it behooves us to think about what patterns do we want to use moving forward and how do we spot the patterns that we don't want to move using forward, move, use moving forward and to soften, um, eliminate, get rid of, um, let go of those patterns. So what are the patterns inside of me that link up to the racist history and the patterns of this country? And if we think of it more like hygiene, Vanessa and I were talking about this, more like hygiene and less like I can be a good person or a bad person, then it becomes less about, um, it becomes less about our own ego we can become less defensive about it. And we can actually become curious and more effective at transforming it. Because then nobody is excluded from this. Everybody is affected by these patterns differently depending on your geography, you know. If you have some power inside of black communities, if you are, if you've been raised inside of them, I have deep friends who are raised in New Orleans who were like, I don't know why Minnesota black people talk about blackness like it's all bad. What are you talking about? Or, you know, I have family members, my grandparents both went to Howard, so I'm love with, you know, very happy about Howard and, and in many ways wish I had gone to Howard instead of Harvard um, for my own mental state. You know what I'm saying? So everyone's affected by these patterns differently depending on your geography. And the places where you have the most experience uh, or you have the most privilege is also the places where you will have the biggest, um, uh, I'm trying not to, uh, the biggest weaknesses, the biggest um, naivetes, the places where the, the, you have the most privilege is the places where your muscles will be less developed. And the people who have to deal with the ramifications of that every single day are going to be so extra sophisticated. But if those people are put from your folks at, behind a veil of, oh, either they're not worth it or they're always, they're, they're, or poor them or 
they, or they, they're disadvantaged, then you will miss out on the sophistication and the brilliance that those people actually have from the work, the daily work that it takes to survive this system every single day and still have some humanity and some joy inside of that. So if we can shift the way we deal with things from this people-centered, bad, good, to like our patterns, then we can also, then we also don't let us ourselves off the hook. Oh, I've read all of these books and I want to encourage anybody who wants to look at, there's so much information out here that as much, Gabriella, as I totally feel like there is relational things that we definitely need to do, folks need to like do the research and their own homework too first and not put it always on brown people to be their only window to learning about things because that is part of the pattern, right? That is, a, it's, that is one of the patterns is to make other people do your work for you. That is a slavery pattern. Um, but that it allows us not to take ourselves off the hook as black people. We have internalized patterns uh, against other black people. Women, we have misogynist patterns against other women. Vanessa, you spoke to that. And if we don't, because if we let ourselves off the hook and think that we're fixed in any one place, then we're going to continue, wherever we think that we're not lethal, whenever we think that any human being is not able to be lethal, then we, um, uh, then we make it, then we blind ourselves or, 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 or we, we become less available to see when we do harm to others without thinking, you know, we will be more likely to do others, to do harm to others thoughtlessly because we've decided that we exist and we hold this fixed position of goodness or fixed position of wokeness or fixed position of righteousness. Because you can be righteous in the streets and uh, ter terrorize your own family. Gandhi, all these people, you know, we, we use the frame and if we, if we fix the frame here, they look real great here. But if we widen the frame out to all the aspects of society, they got some work to do in other places. All of us are messy, messy, messy humans. So if we allow for that, that we gonna fuck up, we're going to be messy, we're going to make mistakes, and that we're trying to work on our patterns, then we can have some compassion for ourselves and for each other that allows the transformation to actually happen. Because the only place you grow and change is the place where you are soft. The only place you grow is where you have possibility to grow where you are not the best and the brightest, where you have a muscle that needs to be developed. That is the potential and the opportunity. And that, and, 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 and that is crucial in terms of moving forward. And that's one of the places where women know all about it, right? You go through the pain on a monthly basis to know that you need to do some reflection you, or you have been through that pain. You have, may have had an experience of actually bringing life through your body. And you may not. But, part, but you know of, of these things with others. You know that you are in need of, of relationship and communication. And so you need to be working with that as well. So it's one of the places where I think that, that women are, are just the leaders, the kinds of leaders that we need. Or a lot of the experiences that women have help us to bring that. But, you know, as I said, women can also be real treacherous to each other. So it's not like, oh, if only everything was a woman, then the world would be perfect. It's like, really? <laughs> Have you seen some women go after each other, really? <laughs> so anyway, I could say a lot more, but <laughs> I just want people to see power in each other. Yes. And power absolutely. in those places where you're, uh, you're encouraged to think that there's nobody else, um, mm -hmm. that, that there is none. Yep. Well, I can't think of a better way <laughs> to conclude our time. And I know I would love to continue for, for quite some time. And I am so, so honored to, to have you all here. Thank you for sharing your time and your contributions to all of us here. Thank you for being a part of the ACF ecosystem. Um, thank you to everybody that, that joined us today. Um, I just want to make sure you all know about um, our 
two upcoming panels. There's one more uh, next week about understanding intersectionality, which we delved in a bit today as well. Um, gender and other identities. That's Friday, October 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 Central, 11 Pacific, um, as well as advocating for gender equity, uh, which is on Monday, October 19th. And both of those you can find more information on either composersforum.org or icarefeelisten.com. And once again, I want to thank our uh, supporters, the, um, the Elizabeth Michelle uh, Sorrell Charitable Organization. And if you want to be a part of ACF, we hope you'll go to our website, composersforum.org. If you are in a position to help support us financially, we greatly value that as well. Um, and also, I want to remind you all to please vote. Uh, you can find out information on our website, composersforum.org slash vote dash. 2020, Damien here has created an incredible resource. Find out when your registration deadline is, uh, what you need to do to get a mail-in ballot, be safe, um, be active, and please participate. We so, so appreciate all of you being here and uh, look forward to seeing you at our next panel. Thank you so much, panelists. Mankwe, Lisa, Gabriella, Stephen. Pleasure. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> End of recording. <laughs>